my name is Ulrich Sommer. I will present uh, the climate, uh, the uh, technical background of the climate crisis today. Um, I am with Extinction Rebellion. Uh, we are a nonviolent direct action uh, organization, and um, we are made up of ordinary uh, of ordinary people. Really, um, I'm a product manager. I worked as a consultant for 20 years. I'm a father of, of two kids and I don't feel especially rebellious. Um, but uh, I heard and I read so much about the climate crisis in the last years and the consequences this will have for me and especially, of course, for my kids. So at some stage I had to get up and do something about it. So what we want to do is to get our governments to take um, radical and decisive action to prevent the um, the uh, worst effects of the climate crisis from happening if we still can. So we have three demands. Um, the, they are rather simple and uh, radical at the same time. I think the first one is tell the tell the truth tell the truth about the ecological and climate crisis and the state we are actually we are actually in um, this is something that i think is very important because uh, our governments and the media um, um, they don't really tell us about the state we are really in and that um, that uh, keeps us um, in a state of normality that's really not sustainable. Um, the second demand is um, act now while we still can get greenhouse gases down to net zero in 2025 and stop biodiversity loss. Um, we have a window for action that's closing fast. We have about five to 10 years left to uh, keep the 1.5 or, or two degrees Celsius goals. And after that, um, things will become probably much, much worse. And our third demand is how do we want to do this? Uh, we think that um, creating citizens' assemblies, uh, which uh, work out recommendations that are uh, worked into the legislative process of governments is our best option to get the necessary um, actions we need and doing this in a social and just way. So let's get to the facts. Um, we have a look at the climate first, um, just to get you all on the same page, I will explain very briefly the um, natural greenhouse effect. So that's energy coming as light, as visible light from the sun and uh, being um, reflected back to space, um, partly uh, by the surface of, uh, of the planet. Um, if we wouldn't have something in our atmosphere to prevent all this energy going back into space. Uh, we would be sitting on an, on an ice ball of about minus 18 degrees uh, on average. And uh, with greenhouse gases, um, part of that energy is trapped. Uh, it is trapped in the bindings of the greenhouse gases and they reflect this energy in all directions, so partly back to Earth. So that keeps or used to keep the Earth at an average temperature of about plus 15 degrees instead of minus 18 degrees. So having this greenhouse gases is absolutely necessary. So, 
what happens since the industrial revolution uh, since the industrial revolution started is that we uh, that we dug uh, fossil fuels out of the earth that were deposited there for millions and millions of of years and acted as carbon sink so all this uh, carbon dioxide was taken out of the equation of the natural carbon cycle for a very long time and for about 200 years now we are putting it back into the equation uh, so quite naturally and that is uh, science that is well understood for about 150 years um, adding greenhouse gases into the atmosphere must lead to heating up of the atmosphere as i said this is theoretically understood for 150 years and we can add we can actually measure it since the 1950s that this is actually happening so um, a brief look i mentioned the carbon cycle so um, the carbon dioxide um, of the planet is moved around in a big cycle between the atmosphere ocean and land in a uh, yearly cycle like one very simple example is um, in the spring and summer um, plants are building up biomass by this taking out carbon dioxide uh, out of the atmosphere and in the autumn and winter part of that biomass is lost again like leaves falling from the trees and so on so part of the carbon dioxide uh, gets back into the air, uh, back into the air, back into the atmosphere by decomposing. So this is uh, equilibrium. And now we added for about 150 years additional um, carbon dioxide to this equilibrium for which there isn't really any place. So um, carbon dioxide mounts up into the atmosphere um, in pre-industrial levels. The concentration was about 200, 280 parts per million, and we are now somewhere between 410 and 420 parts per million. OK, so how can we be sure that this is not a coincidence? that it's just some other factor that leads to a heating planet while carbon dioxide adds up um, or mounts up, but uh, all this is just a coincidence. Um, so if we look at this table, we see on the left a number of observations. We call them fingerprints, like a cooling upper atmosphere, uh, while the lower atmosphere is heating up, um, less, heats, uh, less heat uh, emits um, into space than it used to. Um, the ocean is warming and acidifying uh, relative to the days. Um, nights have been have warmed up faster during the last decades. The same goes for winters relative to summers. So we see a lot of observations and there are possible explanations for climate changes like changes in sun activity, in volcanic activity or just plain internal variability of the climate. But um, all the observations that we make and these are only a few can only explain together and conclusively by carbon dioxide uh, accumulating in the lower atmosphere. And that's exactly what we do. So it's a very strong consensus of evidence and that led, um, or that, that led to a consensus of scientists for uh, now about 20 to 30 years. Uh, there have been several studies uh, concerning what is the 
opinion of scientists on the human effect on climate change and um, uh, scientific consensus is something like um, scientists agree on smoking causing cancer or the benefits of vaccination um, being much uh, more important than the risks. Uh, so a similar um, consensus of scientists has developed among the fact that uh, humans are responsible for the climate change that we see for the last 150 years. Okay, so that's one of the points that I really want to make tonight that yes, there is a debate going on about climate change, but this debate is not a scientific debate, it's a political one. So the facts are clear. There are of course details that are not clear yet. For example, what is the role all of clouds in all this? Is it a positive or a negative one? Um, when will certain things happen? Have we crossed certain tipping points already or not? So there is, of course, discussion going on in the scientific community, but there's no discussion going on about the facts that the climate change that we see is man-made. Okay, so I'll go with you through a few uh, graphs. This is one uh, that shows the temperature of the last thousand years uh, that is measured by proxies like uh, cores of, uh, like a bore cores of glaciers or tree rings or other proxies. Uh, so different areas of science, so like uh, botanists, uh, meteorologists, um, specialists for glaciers, they all take measurements in their field and they all come to the same con conclusion. And as we see the internal variability that we see here also is the same uh, in all measurements and they all agree on the fact that in the last 150 years, temperatures and CO2 levels have skyrocketed. Um, so why is that so important um, to um, talk about half a degree or one degree or two degrees of uh, rising temperature? We uh, have to deal with much larger uh, changes in temperature during one day. So what we are talking about uh, climate-wise is, is um, changes in a global temperature, like measured over the whole planet um, during uh, long periods of time versus local and, uh, yeah, yeah, local changes in day-to-day -day weather. So it's not the same really. The best thing to um, visualize uh, why half a degree or one degree is so important is to imagine climate as a bell curve with normality in the middle, taking off the biggest space in the bell curve. And when you move the whole bell curve, in this case, to the side of heat, then you create a new normal, basically. So a new normal with more heat waves, with more extreme weather, and so on. So that makes it so important to talk about every half degree of, uh, of uh, rising temperature in world climate. Okay, this one is a curve uh, showing the temperature in the last 500 million years. Please note that the scale shifts. We have on the left hundreds of millions of years, then tens of millions of years, millions of years, and thousands of years. Uh, that is done here because otherwise we wouldn't see uh, what has happened in the last few thousand years. Uh, that would be all a little blip. 
So um, I put in a few um, a few um, events here. You have heard certainly about uh, mass extinction events. There have been five in Earth's history. One that I want to mention is the one that occurred at the Perm Prior's border uh, 252 million years ago. That uh, was caused, as we understand it today, by volcanic activity on a truly gigantic scale, leading to acidification of the ocean and heating up of the ocean uh, by about two degrees Celsius, um, leading to uh, the extinction of most uh, of marine life and afterwards most of land-based life. And um, I read a paper from this year where it was calculated that uh, if we con continue burning up fossil fuels as we do now until the year 2300, then we would reach about the same uh, carbon dioxide levels as uh, were back then. So we certainly don't want to do that. Uh, the next um, event was, of course, the one 66 million years ago when a meteor struck the Earth and wiped out the dinosaurs, leading to a period, to a long period of high temperatures and high um, sea levels. So um, humans appeared about 3.3 million years ago. Uh, that's the age of uh, Lucy, the Australopithecus. And uh, Homo sapiens appeared about 300,000 years ago. So uh, we lived through a time of ice ages and warm times, lived as hunters and gatherers most of the time, and then something really extraordinary happened, the climate went into a very stable period about uh, 13,000 uh, um, 13, years ago. That's the area we live in now, we call that the Holocene. And uh, that enabled us really to become sedentary and develop agriculture. And that's really the second important point I want to make tonight. Um, the relevance of what is happening at the moment is we are on the, on the verge of kicking ourselves out of the Holocene. So the CO2 that is accumulated in the atmosphere will stay there for thousands and thousands of years. It will very slowly decline through a new equilibrium. Uh, so what we do now will basically influence all human generations to come. Um, so that is re really uncharted and dangerous territory we are moving our climate into. Okay, so one thing I still want to mention um, are tipping points. That's also something you will probably heard about. Um, the Paris Treaty defined a uh, uh, 1.5 uh, goal to reach or to stay under uh, the uh, temperature rise compared to pre-industrial levels of no more than 1.5 degrees for a good reason, because the climate models that we have, they uh, behave mostly linear like you add CO2 to the model, temperature rises. You, uh, uh, you speed up the level of deforestation, something else happens. So that's all linear, but above this border of about 1.5 degrees, there are um, feedback loops, which, which we call tipping points or tipping elements, um, which are nonlinear. One uh, tipping point which uh, explains this quite well is uh, the melting of the Western Antarctic ice shelf, the one here on the left. Uh, 
seen from space that is a very big white space. So white, of course, reflects more light and more heat back into space than dark space. So if you take away a little bit of that white space and expose the water below, um, that heats up more than the white space that was there. Um, that leads to faster melting, that leads to more water being exposed and so on. So it's a feedback loop. So it's very hard uh, to calculate uh, when uh, the point in this feedback loop is reached when it doesn't stop anymore. Uh, you can only see this, in, you only can see that in hindsight. You can not see a, tip, a tipping point coming, you only see it when you look back and say, oh, there it was. Um, so, um, one tipping point we have in all likelihood um, in all likelihood uh, already crossed is the dying of the coral reefs through um, ocean acidification. That's, uh, CO, that's CO2 being taken up by the ocean and leading to uh, very slight acidification, but that's enough um, to kill off most coral reefs. So we have probably lost them. Uh, you see on the right a uh, number of uh, emission scenarios. The green one um, would uh, lead us into, uh, um, into a uh, temperature uh, rise of below 1.5 degrees if we basically stop emitting carbon dioxide now. And most governments have agreed to, um, to um, emission reductions that will lead us somewhere in between those two intermediate scenarios. And that's why we say this is not enough. Um, this is not good enough. We will um, in all likelihood cross a number of tipping points that will lead us into a world that we will not recognize in 2100. Pro in, in 2100. Okay, so just a brief summary of where we stand. Um, that's the CUT country rating website. Um, oh, by the way, all this information uh, is publicly accessible, uh, is publicly accessible. You can read all the papers, you can go on this website. That's all, no secret. You can all uh, inform yourself about this. So there's only two countries um, that are more or less on track to the Paris uh, Agreement uh, and all the rest of the world with us being somewhere here in the European Union uh, is in various degrees not on track. So at the moment it looks like we are heading for a world that will be um, somewhere bet between three and four degrees warmer in 2100 than it is now. So what does that actually mean? So what, will, what we will see in our lifetimes basically. Um, 2100 is not that far away. Um, I will probably see 2050. Most of you, as I look at you, will in all likelihood see 2070 and your kids will definitely see 2100. So what does that mean? I'm not sure if you can read that. Uh, there's a little text behind all of, this, uh, all of these slides. Um, that's the, uh, uh, the West Atlantic ice, the West and Arctic ice shelf. Um, that uh, will melt if we stay on 
track, um, if we stay on the track as we are now, um, until 2050 to an extent that will uh, uh, raise sea levels for about one meter. And that means at that point, 350 million people will live um, in areas uh, that are below the new high tide line. Uh, inland glaciers, they are important reservoirs for drinking water and for electricity, uh, like for example in the Himalaya and in the Andes. And um, they, uh, they will melt for, uh, for about two thirds to three quarters until 2100 if we stay on the track we are now uh, and that will also affect a great number of people. Coral reefs, I, or, I already mentioned, we in all likelihood have lost already. Uh, most of them will be gone by 2050, um, affecting the livelihood of many people. And one thing that I find even more scary as a biologist, uh, one, one quarter of all marine um, life forms spend part of their life cycle in coral, in coral reefs. So that can mean a massive loss of biodiversity in the oceans with consequences that uh, we can't even begin to anticipate. So uh, land masses, as we saw a few slides ago, um, heat up faster than the ocean. Uh, the whole bell curve is moved to the, uh, to the side of extreme uh, heat events like heat waves and people living in big land masses like China or the Sahel zone um, will be facing um, many heat waves during the year that are so extreme that they basically can't go outside. Uh, so how do they do their harvest and how will they live where they live now? So that also will affect a big number of people. Harvest yields, I just mentioned them. Um, for every additional degree Celsius of global uh, temperature rise, we will see a decline of the most 10, frequent, 10 most frequent crops by about three to seven percent. And if you um, calculate what that means in minimum ratios for people, uh, that means um, less minimum ratios for about uh, 150 to 370 million people. And that in a world that has more like 10 billion people than 7.6 as we have now. And the last bit is, uh, Deforestation uh, through agric agriculture, maybe uh, mainly meat production, leads to uh, deforestation or to an acceler acceleration of deforestation that um, causes about 10% of um, man-made climate change or of, of uh, man-made CO2 emissions. Um, and at the same time, deforestation reduces uh, forests that uh, act as carbon dioxide sinks. And last word, if what happens in Brasilia right now continues to happen at this speed, uh, we will have lost half of the rainforest in 2030 with consequences that are basically incalculable. So that all doesn't sound good. Um, these are like uh, 1.5 million people, uh, 1.5 billion people affected. I'm not saying that these are all refugees. I'm just saying these will be affected during 2050 and uh, 2100. Um, and just to put this into perspective, at the moment we are having uh, 
we are uh, facing 71 million people fleeing their countries for different reasons. And we are talking about the climate crisis. So, yeah, there are more crises to come. So, what do we need to do? <laughs> and uh, I think that's a very important thing here because I don't want to make the impression that it's too late for everything. It's not. We have still a window of time. If you look in Berlin at the gasometer, there is a carbon dioxide clock that uh, leaves us still eight years until the carbon dioxide um, that we are allowed to use up um, according to the Paris Treaty is actually used up, so there is still time. So the first thing we have to do is overcome collective denial. Um, as I mentioned before, we um, of course live our normal lives and it feels normal, but the normality that most of us, including me, um, is living is not sustainable. So we have to get to a point where change is the new normal. So we have moral obligations uh, to other living humans. Uh, most people live in areas uh, where the climate crisis hits first, uh, uh, but the Emissions over the last 150 years were, of course, caused uh, somewhere else. So it's not their fault, but they have to uh, take the burden to future generations, of course, to our kids and grandkids, to ourselves. Like, it doesn't feel good to live in denial, to live in... A, state where we know it's not good, we have to do something, but we can't get ourselves to. So that's something that we want to change for, our, for ourselves too. And of course, to other living things on this planet. Um, just to recap our three demands, tell the, tell the truth. Uh, and we have to get out of our collective denial act now. We have a window still left uh, and we should use it. And beyond politics, um, the way that Extinction Rebellion sees as the best way to go forward is uh, form um, citizens' assemblies on the, on the, um, on the state level uh, and incorporates the uh, recommendations into, um, into the legal process. Okay, um, that's it. The, we have time for questions yes. and answers, and I want to first start with the remote team, the folks in Zurich. Any questions?